Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Evan Berlin, and I am a fourth-year resident in physical medicine and rehabilitation at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. With me today is Dr. Aaron Yang, an associate professor in the Department of PM&R, also at Vanderbilt. We will be discussing the introduction to interventional spinal procedures. We have nothing to disclose in today's lecture. This lecture will be going over some of the C-arm basics, radiation safety, some of the most common needles used in interventional spine procedures, fluoroscopic anatomy, and some of the most common procedures done in the procedure suite. This is a picture of a basic C-arm used for fluoroscopic guided interventions. The portion of the C-arm at the bottom is the source, and it emits the x-rays, and this is commonly positioned below the patient. The top of the C-arm in this picture is the tensifier, and this captures the x-rays and converts it into the pictures that will be displayed on the monitors. The left side of the picture is the control panel for the C-arm, and it can be used to move the C-arm, take the x-rays, and change the quality of the x-ray images. Before attempting any fluoroscopic guided procedures, one must first familiarize themselves with the movements of the C-arm. Here is a table of the terminology of the different movements of the C-arm. You may want to pause the video at this time to get accustomed to this terminology. We will go through these movements one by one to display how these are performed. The first movement we will display is a cephalad or caudal tilt. This is when the C-arm rotates around a transverse axis either towards the head, cephalad, or the feet caudal of the patient. We will now display the oblique movement. The C-arm will rotate circumferentially around the patient either towards or away from the physician. The lateral position refers to 90 degrees oblique. The next movement we will display is the piston, also known as in or out translation. This is when the C-arm translates towards the patient's right or left. Next we are going to do a head or foot translation. This is when the C-arm moves parallel to the patient either superiorly towards the head or inferiorly towards the feet. Next, we will move the C-arm up or down, which is when the C-arm moves towards the ceiling or the floor. Lastly, we will display the wigwag or swivel. This involves the use of a third plane of axis. Typically, this is used while the C-arm is in a lateral position with the C-arm's image intensifier rotating inferiorly with the source rotating superiorly or vice versa. Essentially, this is rotating the C-arm clockwise or counterclockwise around the patient. It is also worth noting that these traditional moves can be and often are combined to optimize the image. An important part of fluoroscopic guided procedures is radiation safety. Increased radiation exposure among physicians using fluoroscopy can cause negative health effects, including but not limited to erythema, cataracts, cancer, or even death. To reduce radiation exposure, one must be educated on three main principles, limiting fluoroscopic exposure time, maximizing their distance from the C-arm, and utilizing shielding strategies. To limit exposure time, attempt to use the C-arm in pulse mode as much as possible and limit the amount of live fluoroscopy. Next, to maximize distance, the participant should always take at least one step back from the C-arm prior to any images being taken. It is worth noting also the inverse square law when it comes to radiation exposure. That is, if you are two times further away, then your exposure is one-fourth what it was, and so on. Lastly, we will go over some uh, strict shielding techniques that should be enforced. Everyone in the procedure suite should always be wearing their lead vest, thyroid shields, lead glasses, and a radiation badge for radiation monitoring. Next, we will go over the common types of needles used during fluoroscopic guided procedures. On the left, we have three quinky needles with different gauges and lengths. These needles are most commonly used in the transforaminal epidural steroid injection approach. On the right is an example of a TUI needle, which is most commonly used in the interlaminar epidural steroid injection approach. 
it is worth noting that the correct needle for the correct procedure for the correct patient such that an optimal outcome is achieved is debatable and out of the scope of this presentation. Hi everyone, my name is Aaron Yang and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Physical Medicine Rehabilitation at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Today we will give an introduction to interventional spine procedures for the AAP 2022 Medical Student Program. I have no financial uh, disclosures. And again, my brief outline, I'm gonna go over very briefly some plur fluoroscopic spine anatomy and then talk about three of the most common spine procedures we do, epidural steroid injections, facet injections, and SI joint injections. So before you perform any type of procedure, I think it's very important to know the anatomy and so we're going to focus on the lumbar spine today. So there's some great resources out there. Uh, one of them is by Dr. Bogduck, where it essentially teaches you how to draw out the lumbar spine anatomy. But importantly, before you do any procedure, you should always review available imaging. And whether that's most likely an MRI of the spine, a CT scan, as well as x-rays. An important thing as a medical student uh, in, in really anything is to have a systematic way of approaching uh, reading an image or even history taking skills, for example. So I wrote down here the ABCs uh, that I often follow in my head when as I approach an X-ray or an MRI. So A stands for alignment, B is bone, C is the cord if you're looking at MRI, D stands for disc, E for exiting nerve roots, F for facets, and G really just for gutter, meaning anything lateral to the central components we're looking at, such as the muscle or even lateral disc herniations. And so really essentially just have a systematic way of approaching imaging so uh, you don't feel like you're missing something. So here's a prime example here. When you're in the floral suite and you're looking at uh, someone in the, what we call the AP view or PA view, sorry, uh, you can look at different elements. And so what are we looking at here? And so here's a drawing on the left and what the outline under fluoroscopy. So you have in the center, you have the spinous process. It looks like a teardrop. On the sides, you have the transverse process. You have the facet joints here. You also have the vertebral body here. When you're looking at a lateral view, you can see sometimes the uh, facet joint here, also known as the zygopophyseal joints. You have the neural foramen where the nerve exits. You have the vertebral body here. So again, just getting familiar of what you're looking at. And I think that is reinforced by drawing it out. Here's another schematic of a cadaver model. And so you can see here in the outline, the vertebral body in the lateral view. You can see the disc here. Then you have the neural foramen where the nerve exits. And here in the cadaver, you see the dorsal root ganglion sitting in the nerve root foramen. And here's a schematic with an MRI here. And again, you have the epidural fat in white surrounding the dorsal root ganglion. And this is a T T1 weighted image. So when you're looking at different components uh, under fluoroscopy, again, you have to be reminded this is a posterior to anterior view. So left is left, right is right. And so again, here I've outlined the vertebral body. And then when you oblique the C-arm, you may hear the term Scotty dog. And so what does that correlate with? So here we are oblique the C-arm towards the right. And you can see here when you're looking at a Scotty dog is what we call it. You have the ear up here, you have the head, the nose, and the leg. And what does that specifically correlate with? Well, the ear is going to be your superior articular process. The eye of the sky dog is the pedicle. The transverse process is the nose. You have the lamina right here going into the front leg, which is your in inferior articular process of the same segment you're looking at. And why is this important? because a lot of our procedures that we do uh, come from this specific view, whether that's a medial branch block, a transframal epidural steroid injection, facet joint intervention, such, a, such as a radio frequency ablation. So I think as a medical student, it's important to recognize that the oblique view is going to be very commonly obtained and to just get an idea of what the different anatomic landmarks are. So when it comes to epidural steroid injections, we have three primarily different routes that we do this. We have the caudal approach, the inner laminar approach, and the transframal approach. And so when you're looking at a transframal approach, we are targeting a specific nerve root. And so we're going either the right or left, 
we're going at between L3-4, L4-5, for example. That's different than a interlaminar epidural steroid injection. We're going into the interlaminar space. And so this may not target a specific nerve root, but more of uh, between vertebral bodies, for example, between L4-5 and L5-S1. And the way this is done, it used to be historically done blind, um, where you feel for a loss of resistance when you enter the epidural spread. Uh, the last one is a caudal epidural steroid injection. Again, this was probably the oldest way epidurals were done, where much more commonly you're going to encounter are transforaminals and interlaminar epidurals. So caudal epidural steroid injection is done through the sacral hiatus. And so going back to the picture that right here, is you can see the needle entering the sacral hiatus and you're putting medication in here and it's just getting a diffuse area, as opposed to a transforaminal approach was going to be targeting again that nerve root itself. And so again, a different schematic. Again, you have the caudal approach coming through the sacral hiatus. You have a transforaminal approach approaching the specific nerve root and the interlaminar approach going between spinous process at a certain level. So the bigger thing is who should maybe benefit from a epidural steroid injection? So patients who are going to benefit the most are those who have radicular pain or pain that radiates into the leg. And there's some evidence that demonstrates there's better outcomes with disc herniations causing radicular pain as opposed to spinal stenosis, whether that's central or foraminal. But patients who are going to get epidurals are those with radicular pain symptoms. Patients with predominantly just back pain or referred pain from other structures are not going to benefit from epidural steroid injections. How can an MRI help when you're doing a procedure? Well, again, if you look, just go off x-rays, you're missing out on a lot of the different elements that you're really concerned about, such as the disc, such as the nerve root. So MRIs can help plan where you're actually going to park the needle and injection. Also can help you come into a procedure suite as a backup plan if your first approach does not help. And really the point of doing an epidural is to put the medication at the target. And so a lot of times people ask, well, what is the target? And the target is really where the neural tissue is affected by some compressive lesion. And you're trying to get that medication near the preganglionic nerve in the ventral epidural space. And so I put this picture up here. So if you have a disc herniation here irritating this exiting nerve root, the interface where the disc is affected by the nerve, this is where you want the medication. And here's the ventral epidural space. And so that's where advanced imaging is going to help you figure out where that needle needs to go. So when you're doing an epidural steroid injection, for example, a transforaminal approach, you have to realize there's lots of different ways where you can put the medicine. In terms of as a medical student perspective, I'm really just showing this as saying, look, not every injection is the same. So if you have, for example, a disc herniation between L3 and L4, and it's getting this blue nerve where it's the traversing nerve root, you can realize you can put the needle in many different locations. And again, you're trying to get the medication the closest area to where that nerve is affected. And so I circled these two areas. And essentially what, what I mean by that is you can park the needle here around the infraneural part of the foramen at L3-4, or you could do what's called a supraneural approach where you're coming from the level below and trying to get the medication to flow up. So all that said, in terms of different ways to do an injection, there's multiple approaches. And so one of the terms I just used was supraneural and infraneural. What does that mean? Well, first you have to know the supraneural approach is probably the most common way we do transforaminal epidural steroid injections. What we mean by that is we're putting the needle above the exiting nerve root. So you can see here, the nerve comes right, the needle comes right below the pedicle and it's above this exiting nerve root. The infraneural approach is below the exiting nerve root. And so again, just even at that same level, you can put the needle above or below the nerve root. And so here's a schematic of a supraneural approach. As I mentioned before, the needle is right above the exiting nerve root. And so when you're looking at contrast flow patterns, you can see the contrast flow right around that pedicle and it goes superior. 
And that's different in terms of how we approach with an infraneural where you are below the exiting nerve root. And you can see one of the dangers of doing potentially an infraneural approach is you're getting close to the disc space and potentially affecting the disc itself. Now, an infraneural approach can have varying contrast flow patterns. But for example, here at L5, you can see there's predominantly a flow that goes inferior or a caudal here in this case. So really with epidurals, we're using this for radicular pain. Epidurals are helpful for treating radicular pain. And in terms of steroid use, we tend to use dexamethasone for transforaminal epidural steroid injections. And the reason we do that is because dexamethasone is what we call a non-particulate steroid. Particulate steroids, for example, such as triamcinolone, and you can take a look at the bottle and it's chalky white. There has been risks with uh, spinal cord infarction by using large particulate steroids if it gets into a blood vessel. So with a higher risk of vascular uptake with the transforaminal approach, majority of providers are going to be using dexamethasone as the first line choice for steroids. And studies have shown that there is effective as particulate steroid. So in order to minimize the risk, dexamethasone is going to be which is going to be the most common steroid encountered. And so, um, as I mentioned, having imaging is important because it helps you target where you need to place the medication. And there's evidence to show that better targeting has better outcomes. And as I try to explain very briefly, not all epidural steroid injections are the same. So moving on to the second most common injection that we may do or intervention are interventions targeting the lumbar facet joint. So lumbar facet joints uh, have been implicated to be a more common cause in the older population. And majority of facet mediated pain in the lumbar spine come between the L4-5 and the L5-S1 facet joints. And there's been no studies that sh demonstrate that imaging findings are very consistent in diagnosing lumbar facet joint pain. And so when we think about different procedures we can do for facet joint pain, we have diagnostic procedures such as medial branch blocks. And we also have therapeutic injections like intraarticular steroid injections into the facet joint or radio frequency ablation. So when you're thinking about patients who may have facet mediated pain, again, this is going to be your older age population Pain is going to be worse along the lumbar paraspinal muscles and in the low back. As I mentioned before, L4-5 and L5-S1 are the most common levels that are affected. Less likely to have facet mediated pain in the younger age population. If they have pain with flexion, if there's pain right over the spinous process, or we're thinking more of the disc as the pain generator. If patients complain of pain below the knee, then we're not thinking necessarily of facet joint pain. Someone like Justin Bieber, unlikely they have to set mediated pain. So as I mentioned before, there's not been one single imaging finding or physical exam maneuver that helps diagnose facet mediated pain. So as a result, medial branch blocks are the gold standard for diagnosing facet mediated pain. And so what we do is we are anesthetizing the medial branches. And as a result, if they find relief with the uh, the diagnostic block, then that can help diagnose facet mediated pain. And so each facet joint has two medial branches that innervate the facet joint. And so it can be very confusing when you're thinking about uh, numeration for the lumbar spine. But when you think about uh, the different facet joints, just know that there's two medial branches that innervate it here. So uh, again, I don't want to belabor this, but I think that when you're thinking about, for example, the L3-4 facet joint here, you have two medial branches and you would have contribution from the L2 medial branch and the L3 medial branch. So when you're blocking a specific facet joint, you are blocking two medial branches. And so here's just a couple pictures of the needle at the target of where the medial branch is. And that's going to be at the junction of your transverse process and your superior articular process, as you can see here in these two pictures. And you can see here in this schematic, this is where the medial branch is, again, at that junction of the superior articular process and the transverse process. If patients find significant relief with a medial branch block, 
Then the next step that can be offered is a radio frequency ablation. And what you are doing with radio frequency ablation, you're cre using electrical energy at the tips of the needle to cause a thermal lesion and coagulation of the nerve uh, nerve at that location. And so essentially what you're doing is you're causing a um, blockade of the pain receptor at that medial branch. And so I love this picture in, but really the bottom line is that there's different needles people can use and they can cause different lesion sizes based on the gauges of the needle. So intuitively, the larger gauge needle you use, the larger area of the ablation that can occur. So in summary, when you're thinking about lumbar facet mediated pain, imaging and history and physical have limited diagnostic validity. And as a result, medial branch blocks tend to be the gold standard for diagnosing facet mediated pain. I did not go into this, but again, um, we tend to use two medial branch blocks to diagnose someone, whether or not they respond well to an ablation. And so we know that if you just do one medial branch block, there's a high false positive rate around 40%. And so that's why we do two medial branches. So we're not taking patients with false positive response to a medial branch block to an ablation. I also didn't go in depth into this, but facet joint injections have been less validated for diagnosis. So there's been studies that show there's not really great evidence for long-term therapeutic efficacy. So oftentimes when we're thinking therapeutic interventions for facet media pain, we're thinking about lumbar ablation. And so I talked briefly about different gauges causing larger lesion size. I also did not go over this in depth, but there's a way you can place the needles to do an ablation where there's better outcomes that are seen with parallel approach versus perpendicular again, outside the scope maybe of this lecture. And then lastly, there's injections into the sacroiliac joint region. And so you can either inject right into the joint with steroids, which is seen here, or you can ablate the nerves that go to that posterior sacroiliac joint complex as you see here. And so there's different ways these injections are done. You can do them with ultrasound guidance, fluoroscopic guidance, and less commonly done with CT guidance due to the radiation exposure. And so the ch there's pros and cons with each. You know, ultrasound, it can be easier to perform at the bedside. However, it's difficult to know if there's vascular flow. Um, and it also can be harder to uh, verify whether you're truly in the joint with contrast use, as opposed to fluoroscopy, where you may see better contrast spread using fluoroscopy as opposed to extra, or as opposed to ultrasound guidance. However, it's not perfect because even though you're using one of these modalities, we know that there's times where you're not actually truly in the joint itself. The other point I wanted to make is that the sacroiliac joint and the area around it has dual innervation. And so posteriorly in the orange, you have innervation from the sacral lateral branches from S1 to S3. In the actual anterior portion of the joint, you have innervation from the lumbosacral trunks, obturator and gluteal nerves. So what does that mean when there's dual innervation? Well, pain can arise from the joint itself. It can arise from the posterior ligaments or it can arise from both. And so when you're actually injecting steroids into the joint itself, it may only partially provide relief if there's pain coming from the posterior sacroiliac ligaments. On the other side, if you are only affecting the extra articular ligaments with the sacral lateral branch block, you may be missing pain that's arising from the SI joint itself, because again, I mentioned there's dual innervation. So when you're deciding to ablate the nerves and you ever see someone do the ablation of the sacroiliac joint area, it's really only going to affect the posterior portion of this and not the intraarticular portion of the SI joint itself. So when you think of just a common scenario, how patients, or sorry, how uh, providers uh, approach the SI joint, they may start off with a intraarticular joint injection. And if they find some level of relief, they may repeat the injection, or they may go to a sacral lateral branch block where you just block the nerves temporarily and see if they will respond to potentially with a radio frequency ablation. However, when you look at the literature, there's always problems when you're just doing a intraarticular injection and then going to an ablation. Because I mentioned before with medial branch blocks, there's always a chance for a false positive rate with one injection into the joint. And there's also technical limitations when you're injecting steroids into the joint itself. 
because that medication can leak posteriorly and get around the sacrolateral branches, which can lead to a false positive. Sometimes the joint communicates with the S1 foramen, and that can also lead to a false positive. And sometimes you just can't access into the joint. And so that can also lead to a false positive when you think you're in the joint itself, but the needle is really parked outside of the joint. And so again, we can't assume that all pain is just from the joint itself. That's really my bottom line with this is that pain can arise from outside the sacroiliac joint itself. This is just a schematic of what we call sacrolateral branch blocks when you're just anesthetizing the sacrolateral branches here. And again, you're not in the joint itself. You're anesthetizing where the, the sacrolateral branches exit from the sacral foramen. So really, when you look at the literature of uh, relief with a sacrolateral ablation, it's really all over the place. And really the main reason for that is because people were getting these ablations based on their response to putting a steroid injection into the joint. And hence, that's why the outcomes are all over the place. Although there's some evidence that there's meaningful outcomes with an ablation, I think future literature is going to focus on patients who get an ablation after they've done a sacrolateral branch block. So key points, um, again, I didn't really go over the history and physical part, but history, physical exam, imaging findings all have limited uh, limitations when you're trying to diagnose SI joint pain. Not all SI joint pain is from the joint itself. And how you decide to do a interventional treatment can vary depending on what part of the SI joint complex you're treating, whether you're trying to treat the joint itself versus the posterior joint complex and ligaments. And so when you're thinking about doing an ablation on someone, they should not get it based on how they find relief with a intraarticular injection, but how they find relief with sacrolateral branch blocks. So some take home points here. Again, I really think that needle driving skills can be taught to anyone at any time. Really is important to know who to inject, where to inject and when to inject. That's going to really separate someone from everyone else. Epidurals can help with radicular pain. They're not all created equal. Targeting where that injection goes matters. Lumbar medial branch blocks are the gold standard for diagnosing facet mediated pain and can predict response to an ablation. And pain can arise from different areas around the sacroiliac joint. And so choosing the right injection can make a difference. So I wanted to give some acknowledgements to some people here. Again, I've taken some slides from some of these people, but also have contributed to this. So. And again, I appreciate your time. If you guys have any questions, you can reach out via social media. Um, and again, I really appreciate uh, your interest in this.